Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing protein folding and protein folding diseases. Okay, so in the previous video what we did is we went over the basics of proteostasis, which remember is the maintenance of a constant proteome, which is this set of functional proteins inside a cell. Okay, so proteostasis involves the synthesis of new proteins, the folding of those nascent polypeptides into a native three-dimensional structure. Okay, and then uh, the refolding of those uh, proteins into the native three-dimensional structure if they happen to misfold. Okay, and if it's not possible to refold them into the functional good structure, what we then need to do is degrade them, okay, either through autophagy or through the ubiquitin proteasome pathway to prevent them aggregating either into amorphous aggregates or amyloid fibrils, which can have devastating consequences that we'll see later. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, what I want to do in this video is firstly I want to talk about a related but different term which is the concept of denaturation of a protein, okay, and then I want to study protein folding in a little bit more detail. So I want to firstly talk about the Anfinsen experiment, which is a really crucial experiment for understanding protein folding, and then I want to talk about the Levinfeld paradox and then we'll look at the resolution to the Levinfeld paradox, and we'll look at free energy funnels. Okay, and then we'll end the video there, and then the next video what we'll do is we'll move on to looking at chaperones in more detail. Okay, right. Uh, so, firstly then, uh, the concept of denaturation. Okay, so, what's the difference then between a denatured protein and a misfolded protein? Okay, well, they're very much so related concepts, but the definitions are different. Okay, so a denatured protein is a protein that is misfolded. So all, uh, mis all, sorry, all denatured proteins are misfolded proteins, but it's specifically a misfolded protein that has lost its function. That's the crucial thing, okay, that the protein has changed structure so much that it's lost its function, okay? So not all misfolded proteins are necessarily denatured, okay? They might have still got their um, function retained, okay? So that's the difference between the concept of a denatured protein and a misfolded protein, that a misfolded protein is just a protein that's changed its structure from the native three-dimensional state, okay? Uh, whereas a denatured protein is one that's changed its structure enough that it has now uh, lost its function. Okay, right. Then there is the concept then of completely denatured, so a completely denatured protein, okay? Now, a completely denatured protein is effectively an unfolded protein. It's a nascent polypeptide, okay? The only structure that the polypeptide now has is uh, its primary structure, okay? So, if you completely denature a protein, you effectively return it down to just being the polymer of amino acids where there are no other interactions uh, that are holding this thing in a shape. Okay, so it completely loses its three-dimensional structure and effectively returns back down to being a one-dimensional structure. Okay, right. Now, uh, there are certain agents which are capable of denaturing proteins, which are known as denaturing agents. Okay, and the famous denaturing agents which are capable of causing protein to change its structure enough that it then uh, loses its functions are uh, by heating proteins up, so heat. Now, he the way that heat uh, causes proteins to denature is that it will break the hydrogen bonds, and hydrogen bonds are an extremely important um, bond that is involved in holding proteins together. Okay, so remember hydrogen bonds underlie most of the secondary interactions, so alpha helices and beta sheets, those are held together by hydrogen bonds. Okay, it also underlies tertiary inter many tertiary interactions as well. So heat will disturb hydrogen bonds, and this is how uh, heating a protein up can cause it to misfold, basically. Okay, so hydrogen bonds are going to break and therefore it will leave the uh, native structure and go to a misfolded structure and often that will be a big enough change that the protein will then lose its function and therefore will be denatured. 
Okay, other uh, powerful denaturing agents are detergents. Okay, now remember detergents are special molecules in that they have a, a very polar portion and they also have a hydrophobic portion. Okay, so they're often shown something like this. The, another word for them is emulsifiers. Okay, they are capable of mixing uh, fatty molecules with water molecules, okay? And it, hopefully it should now be ringing bells that potentially these are going to interrupt the hydrophobic interactions. So emulsifiers have these two portions. They have a portion which I've now colored in in orange, which is going to be extremely hydrophobic and is therefore going to interact well with other hydrophobic molecules. Okay, so the key property, remember, of hydrophobic molecules is that you have to have a neutral structure. Okay, you have to have not much uneven distribution of charge. So this portion in orange of the molecule is going to have very sort of neutral, even distribution of charge. Okay, and that means that uh, it's going to interact with other uh, molecules that are neutral and not very well with water. Whereas this portion that I'm now colouring in at blue at the head of the molecule, this is going to be the polar portion or the hydrophilic portion, and this is going to interact well with water. So basically, the reason that emulsifiers can help um, allow hydrophobic or lipid molecules to interact with water is that this portion can interact with water molecules whilst this portion can interact with the fat molecules and therefore effectively you can bind water molecules to fat molecules uh, via the emulsifier in the middle. Okay, so this is going to interrupt the hydrophobic interactions that are so crucial in determining uh, the um, native state of proteins. Okay, so this is going to interrupt the hydrophobic interactions. Okay, so previously, when the protein wasn't in the presence of a detergent, the uh, hydrophobic residues all had to be hidden uh, deep within the protein so that they weren't on the surface and weren't capable of interacting with water. Now, in the presence of the detergent, that's not necessary anymore. Uh, the hydrophobic molecules can be on the surface because they can just bind to a detergent molecule and then the detergent molecule can bind to the water molecule. Okay, so it interrupts hydrophobic molecules and causes the protein to change its conformation and misfold. Okay, right. And then another key uh, denaturing agent, the final one that I'm going to mention, is uh, pH. Okay, so if, for instance, you make the pH extreme, okay, if you vary it away from physiological pH, which is around 7.5, uh, you can cause proteins to denature. Okay, so let's think about what would happen then if uh, you made uh, the pH too acidic, okay, and it's the exact opposite if you made it too basic. Well, basically, what does that mean? It means that the proton concentration in free solution is going to be very, very high. Okay, now, quite a few of the R groups of uh, the polypeptide will have acidic or basic residues, okay? So, let me just draw another picture here. So, if this is our, oops, if this is our polypeptide here again, okay, some of the residues will be acidic residues, okay, which means that they're capable of donating protons away, and some of our residues will be basic residues, which means that they're capable of receiving a proton. Okay, now, uh, basically, if the proton concentration is very high in free solution, what will happen is all the acidic residues will not donate their protons away. They will re retain their protons, okay, because of the high proton concentration that's in the solution. So all of the acidic residues will have their protons and therefore will be neutral. Meanwhile, all of the basic residues will now accept protons, and when the basic residues accept protons, they become positively charged. Okay, so now that leads to the whole molecule gaining a positive charge, basically, okay? And if you have enough basic residues in here getting enough positive charge, that can build up, and that basically just leads to the whole polypeptide falling apart because sheer electrostatic repulsion repels the polypeptide apart, okay? So if you've got another basic residue here that's also got a proton, and another one over here that's also got a proton there, they're all going to repel apart, and that can force the polypeptide apart out of its native three-dimensional structure. 
Okay, in contrast, let's think about if we made the pH to alkaline, that would mean we took the proton concentration right down in solution. Okay, now all of the basic residues would not have protons attached. Okay, so if I draw this here, here's the protein now. All of these basic residues would now no longer have protons attached at that really low proton concentration. And instead what would happen is all the acidic residues would donate their protons away. So this one would donate its proton away and get a negative charge. Okay, let's put some more on here. Let's say this is another acidic residue. It would donate its proton away and get a negative charge. This one down here would also donate its proton away and get a negative charge. And therefore you'd end up with loads of negatively charged residues. And again, the same thing would happen in reverse, basically. Um, uh, well, it's the exact opposite scenario, but the same thing, the same result overall. Negative charges repel, and therefore that will push the polypeptide apart, basically. Okay, so two um, extreme pHs can tip um, the protonation of the basic residues and the acidic residues to one side, and that can overcharge the molecule, basically, and it can force the molecule to denature or misfold or completely unfold, potentially, uh, because of electrostatic repulsion. Okay, right, uh, so those are denaturing agents, okay? Now, um, when you denature proteins, one of the things that I just like to draw your attention to, and this has a nice real-world correlate, okay, and it's always nice when things have real-world correlates, okay, when you denature proteins, the same thing happens uh, as, uh, well, when you denature proteins with one of these denaturing agents, the same things that we've been discussing previously uh, are going to occur. These are misfolded proteins, after all. Okay, what do misfolded proteins do? Well, we know what misfolded proteins do. They have a tendency to aggregate. Okay, uh, so let's think about amorphous aggregates. You're going to have... Um, hydrophobic residues all over the place along these polypeptides here. Okay, these are now going to be exposed to water, so what's going to end up happening is multiple polypeptides are going to end up uh, aggregating together. So basically, when you denature proteins, it's very similar concept to when you misfold proteins. In fact, it's almost identical. Um, by these denaturing agents here, it also leads to proteins aggregating. And what's the real-world correlate of that? Well, um, I'll raise the problem firstly. Have you ever wondered why, when you boil an egg, the egg white go turns from being a liquid to being a solid? Generally, things do not do that when you heat them up. Generally, when you heat things up, they go from being a solid to being a liquid. A good example is ice, for instance. Okay, things melt. Uh, but eggs, when you heat them up, when you boil them, uh, the egg white goes from being a liquid to being a solid. Why is that? Well, what is actually happening is you are denaturing the proteins within the egg uh, white okay, by the heat. The heat is causing them to misfold. Okay, they're then getting hydrophobic residues also exposed to the water molecules. Okay, and then what's caused it happening is that uh, these misfolded proteins are aggregating together and forming precipitates, basically, which are then solid. And that's why, when you boil an egg, the egg white turns solid. You are effectively seeing the effect of forming huge, great protein aggregates, basically. Okay, so that's a nice real-world correlate. Okay, so what we're now going to go on to, and this is why it's good that we've discussed these denaturing agents here, which are capable of causing proteins to misfold. We're going to go on to a very, very famous experiment, okay, in protein folding, which is the Anfinson experiment. Okay, and this proves a really foundational concept, okay? So this is the Anfinson experiment. So what is this foundational concept that we're going to prove firstly? And then I'll describe what the experiment actually does. Okay, so the foundational concept that we're going to prove is that the information for protein folding is completely contained within the primary structure of the protein. Okay, so if we've got our nascent polypeptide here, it has a certain sequence of amino acids. Okay, basically, the concept that we are trying to prove is that this sequence of amino acids 
determines how the protein folds completely and utterly. Okay, it determines the 3D structure of the protein, that this contains all the information for how the protein should fold, that the, the native structure of the protein. Okay, now that may seem really obvious to you, but think about it for a second. How do we not know that there isn't some little machine inside cells that is getting information potentially from another piece of RNA and is working out from that other piece of RNA uh, how to fold the protein up? We don't, okay? Um, this is a hypothesis, okay? But the Anfinson experiment is a very powerful piece of evidence in favour of it being true, that proteins fold um, and that folding is completely determined by the sequence of amino acids in the primary structure, okay, i.e. all the information for a protein's folding is completely stored in its primary structure. Okay, so let me describe what the Amphenson experiment involves then and how it proves this. It's a very simple experiment. Okay, so basically what the Amphenson experiment did is it took a small protein, and this is very key, it took a small protein, and the protein that they specifically used, although it's not particularly important, all that's important is that it's small, okay, was ribonuclease A, okay, and the only thing that you need to take from that, as I say, is that this is a small protein. If you're interested, ribonuclease A is specifically an RNA's enzyme. It cuts RNA molecules, it breaks down RNA molecules. Okay, but what it does is not important for our uh, purposes. Okay, so we have this ribonuclease A protein, and what's important actually about its function is that there's an easy way of assaying whether it's working, okay, by seeing if our mRNA molecules get broken down, okay, so we can easily see whether this protein is functional, okay, and what Anthinson did is uh, he denatured this protein using denaturing agents, okay, so what did he do? He put it in a really concentrated uh, solution containing urea, okay, so urea is a um, denaturing agent that I haven't mentioned previously, but I'll draw it now. Okay, so urea has a carbonyl group at the centre, and then two amino groups coming off like that. Okay, and it's very, very good at disrupting hydrogen bonds. So it's a very powerful denaturing agent. It causes proteins to misfold. Okay, right, so he put this ribonuclease A in a really concentrated solution of urea, and he actually did something else as well. He also put in a reducing agent, okay, uh, I don't know specifically which reducing agent he put in, but it will be something along the lines of beta macaptoethanol or diphyophreatol, okay? And um, what then does reducing agents do? Well, reducing agents are capable of breaking disulfide bonds. Okay, now disulfide bonds are the strongest form of bond that holds together tertiary structures within proteins. Okay, and it's formed between two cysteine residues. So let me just discuss disulfide bonds because they're very important. Okay, so... And this is not a secondary structure, this is a tertiary structure, okay? So it's going to form between R groups of amino acids within the polypeptide, and it's going to help uh, turn, well, fold the protein into its native structure. Okay, so how does this work then? So let me draw a, a cysteine residue firstly, because that's the star of the act here. Okay, so here is the core amino acid structure then firstly. And then the R group of a cysteine residue consists of first the methylene group, like so, and then a thiol group coming off the methylene group, like so. Okay, now, what you can do is if you bring another cysteine residue here, so I'll draw another one of these, like so, here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon, this time we'll need it oriented in the opposite direction, here's the carboxylic acid group, and then here is the R group this time, and basically what you can do is you can remove the hydrogens off these file groups. Okay, so get rid of this. This is gone. I didn't even bother drawing the other one. And you can bind the two sulfur atoms together. Okay, and that bond is known as a disulfide bond. Okay, and it's a very strong bond. It's one of the strongest bonds that uh, holds proteins together, basically. Okay, reducing agents break disulfide bonds. Okay, and this is important because in ribonuclease A you specifically have 
four disulfide bonds. Okay, so if I just draw you a little picture of what ribonuclease A might look like. Okay, maybe it looks like this. Here's a disulfide bond. Let's say here's another disulfide bond. Here's another disulfide bond. And here's another disulfide bond. Okay, so the reducing agent, uh, whatever it is, is going to break these disulfide bonds, and that's important if we want to completely denature the uh, protein. Okay, so urea and the reducing agent together are powerful enough to completely denature the ribonuclease A. So it returns down to just being the primary structure, basically. Okay, now, of course, we can see that it's denatured, okay, because uh, the function of the protein has now completely gone. Okay, so when you put uh, the protein in this mixture containing urea and the reducing agent, it loses its function. It no longer breaks down RNA. Surprise, surprise. Okay, what was a surprise then is that if you remove the urea and the reducing agent from the medium, okay, and leave the ribonuclease A, what you then find is that the function of the ribonuclease A is returned Okay, so it regains its function. Now, what that implies is that the ribonuclease A will refold into its native structure spontaneously, basically. Okay, and that showed then that you didn't need little machines inside the cell uh, to determine how the protein folded. You didn't even need little machines inside the cell to help the protein fold. It would just spontaneously fold. Okay, now, ribonuclease A, as I said, is a very small protein, okay? And this does work for other very small proteins, but for larger proteins, they don't fold spontaneously into their native structure uh, if you do this experiment, basically, okay? Uh, so, small, well, larger proteins do need help folding into their native structure, but we still believe that larger proteins all of that, the information about the protein folding is contained within the primary structure of the protein itself. Okay, so as soon as you've made the primary structure of the protein, the native structure of that is determined. There's no mechanism to decide what structure the protein is going to have after that. Okay, and that's not a totally trivial result if you think about it. Okay, right. Uh, so, the next thing that I want to talk about uh, with regards to protein folding is another very important point, which is what's known as levin fowles paradox. Okay, and this is about how do proteins actually get into their native conformation. Okay, from being a nascent polypeptide, how do proteins actually adopt their native conformation? Okay, and levin fowles paradox is a paradox in this. Okay, it basically says that proteins can't ever find their native conformation. Okay, so, uh, what then does levin fowles paradox involve? Well, basically, this is the paradox. Imagine that we have a polypeptide of 100 amino acids in length. Okay, so 100 alpha alpha, that just means amino acids. Okay, and let's imagine that each one of the amino acids can be in, let's say, 10 different conformations. Okay, and that's reasonable to assume. Okay, so let's say that every single one of the 100 amino acids can be in one of 10 different conformations. Okay, so that means that the total number of conformations of the entire polypeptide are 10 to the power of 100, okay? Because this one has 10 different states it can be in, this one has 10 different states it can be in, this one has 10, this one has 10, so the total number of confirmations the whole thing could have is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, 100 times, okay? Because you have to decide for every single one which confirmation you want it to be in. Okay, so that means that the total number of conformations of this protein are 10 to the 100, let's say, just as an approximation. Okay, so if we then assume that polypeptides fold spontaneously by just randomly going through different conformations, okay, how long would it take for the protein to get into the correct native conformation? Okay, well, let's think about how long it would take for the protein to actually go through every single possible conformation. Okay, well, um, basically, 
um, there is a number that I'm not going to show you the derivation of, which is 10 to the negative 13 seconds, okay? And this, apparently, is the minimum time it would take for the polypeptide to move between one conformation and another conformation, okay? So some physicist or chemist has worked out that this is the minimum time that possibly you could ha expect to have uh, for the polypeptide to move from one conformation to another conformation. I think it's something like the vibration speed of molecules or something along those lines. Okay, so how long then would it take you to uh, move through all of these 10 to the 100 conformations? Well, if you've got 10 to the 100 conformations to move through, and it takes 10 to the negative 13 seconds to go through each one of them, then that means that we just need to times these two numbers together. And that then gives 10 to the 87 seconds as the amount of time it would take us to go through every single one of those conformations. Okay, now let's uh, move that into a unit that is more meaningful, okay, uh, which is years. Let's move it into how many years it would take. So there are 60 seconds in a minute, there are 60 uh, minutes in an hour, there are 24 hours in a day, and there are 365 days in a year. Okay, now that's a hideous calculation to do. Let's make it easier. Okay, let's round up. Let's say 60 is 100. Let's say this one's 100 as well. We'll round 24 up to 100 as well. And we'll round 365 up to 1,000. So this number, whatever it is, is most definitely smaller than this number. So we've grossly overestimated this calculation. Okay, now let's work out what this is. 100 times 100 times 100 is a million. Times 1,000 is a billion. So this is 10 to the 9. Okay, so that's how many seconds, according to our awful estimate, uh, are in a year. Okay, and this is a complete overestimate, just because I can't be bothered to work out that. Okay, so if we say that that's roughly the amount of seconds in a year, then if we want to work out how many years this is, we all we have to do is divide this by this. Okay, so we'll get 10 to the 78 years then to go through every single one of those confirmations. Okay, which I believe is longer than the lifetime of the universe. Much longer than the lifetime of the universe. Okay, so evidently proteins do not just go through every single confirmation looking for their master confirmation, their native confirmation. It's just not doable. Okay, and the um, number of 10 different confirmations for each amino acid, that was, you know, that was a reasonable number to take. Okay, so that is levin files paradox, which basically says that according to our uh, original theory, that potentially these polypeptides were just going through uh, each confirmation randomly, and um, and um, this was the number of potential confirmations, then it's impossible for proteins to follow the conclusions that you would come to. So that's levin files paradox. Okay, so what then is the resolution to levin files paradox? Let me now describe to you then how proteins actually fold up. What is the process of protein folding? And at the moment I'm going to describe it spontaneously, like the ribonuclease A. How would the protein fold spontaneously? Later on in the next video we'll come on to chaperones, which really just assist the folding. Okay, they're not little machines that are actually sticking this bit on here, deciding that they want this bit over here. Okay, they just assist the protein going into this native confirmation. But all of the decisions about what the native confirmation actually is, that's taken by the protein's primary structure. Okay, all that information is already there. Okay, right. So, let me describe then the spontaneous folding process. Okay, and then I'll show you what's known as a uh, free energy funnel for the folding process. Okay, so we start off then with our nascent polypeptide, which is just this primary uh, structure. This is just a polymer of amino acids. Okay, right. Then the first thing that is believed to occur in the folding process is that you form the secondary structures. Okay, specifically the first secondary structures that are believed to form are the alpha helices. Okay, so maybe you start forming an alpha helix. And alpha helices might extend, so you don't just suddenly get an alpha helix bursting into existence. It will start off small and it will gradually extend. Okay, but the alpha helices seem to be one of the first things that forms. Okay, so here it is. Here is an alpha helix, which I'll highlight in red. 
Okay, right, so you form the alpha helices, okay, then the second uh, secondary structures are formed, okay, so you start forming uh, beta sheets, okay, so I'll show a beta sheet here. So let's have some beta sheets, so here is our beta sheet, then we've still got this alpha helix here, okay, and then here is another beta sheet here, okay, or rather they're beta hairpins, what I've drawn here. Okay, but more generally they could be beta sheets. So here is one beta strand, here is another beta strand. Here we go. Same over here. And I'll colour in that alpha helix again in red. Okay, so now we've formed the two different types of secondary structures. Okay, and these secondary structures are also described as local structures. Okay, because they involve amino acids that are close by one another interacting. Okay, now what's going to happen is the more global bonds are going to be formed, okay, where uh, amino acids that are very far apart in the primary structure are starting to bind together. Okay, so now it'll start forming the actual full tertiary structure. So let me show this now. So here is our uh, first um, beta hairpin here. Okay, so there's that beta strand, there's that beta strand. Okay, then let's imagine that the alpha helix comes out in front here, like so, and then that this other beta hairpin here is now sitting behind and is going to interact with um, is going to interact with um, this other beta hairpin here. Okay, like so. So here is C. So if I put the direction of those in here. Here is another one beta strand and there's another beta strand and this will form a beta sheet with the alpha helix sitting out the front and there'll be all sorts of bonds holding that together and then that's the native structure of this protein and that's a protein that I've just made up basically but to illustrate the point that you form the alpha helices first then the beta structures and then the more global structures where you have amino acids very far away uh, coming together to interact. Okay, right. Uh, so, how then does this solve the levin falls paradox? Well, the way that this solves the levin falls paradox can be really nicely diagrammatically explained with what are known as free energy funnels. Okay, so these are very helpful for understanding the levin falls paradox. Okay, and I really should have done this on the other page. Okay, so, free energy funnels, we'll do it here. Okay, and the idea here with free energy funnels is that you can represent the different conformations of the protein as points on a surface, okay? So what I, I'll draw the free energy funnel first, and then I'll explain how it actually, well, what it actually means, okay? So, here then is my free energy funnel, okay, and it's basically... Um, a surface that then has an invagination going downwards like a funnel here, okay, like so. So it's a two-dimensional surface that suddenly sort of uh, invaginates inwards down there to a point at the bottom here. Okay, now why is this useful for understanding how proteins fold? Well, what you have to view is you have to view each point on this surface, so each little point on this surface as representing a conformation of the protein. Okay, so people often talk about conformational space. So each point is a point in conformational space. Now, of course, conformational space would be far higher dimension than two dimensions, but of course, it becomes difficult for us to visualize in higher than two dimensions. Okay, so um, we um, represent the picture on two dimensions, uh, but in reality, it would be much more dimensions than that. Okay, but for understanding purposes, we're representing it as two-dimensional. Okay, so each point on this surface represents a different conformation, and conformations that are close to one another on the surface will be conformations that are, you know, alike each other, very close to each other, where you have to do very little alterations to turn one into each other, whereas conformations that are far apart on the surface will be very, very different conformations. Okay, now, what then does the height represent? The height represents the free energy of that conformation, so how much energy that conformation has. And the idea is, with this funnel, 
that what will what you'll start off in the nascent polypeptide, which will be some point on the energy funnel here, okay? And then what you'll do is you'll change conformation gradually, okay? And you've just got to gradually fall into the depths of this funnel because really you can only lose energy. I mean, it's not impossible that you can gain energy, but it's unlikely that you gain energy back again, okay? Because once you have gone to a conformation with a lower energy, so let's say, you start off here, okay, on that blue-black smudge there, okay, and you've now gone down to here, where you're starting to tip into the invagination. I'll just make sure this is straight, okay? So let's say you've moved from there to there now, okay? Really, you cannot go backwards, okay, because you have given out energy when you moved from that to that, and that energy has now gone off into the vast, vast universe, potentially, the chances that you are going to get that energy back again are not brilliant, okay? Now, you might say, but, you know, energy is energy. You can just get some energy from somewhere else, okay? But again, that's unlikely. You need a lot of molecules to hit you and transfer energy into you if you're going to get that energy back again, okay? So, the likelihood of getting energy back that you can use to go up the funnel is much lower than the chance that you can give out energy. You can always give out energy, okay? It doesn't take any effort at all to give out energy. It takes much more luck to get energy back again. So it's much more likely that you will go down this funnel than go back up, okay? So, really, the only way you can now go is down. So you can take your pick where you want to go, but you've got to go down. And then gradually you're just going to edge down, 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 and then you get to this final point at the bottom, and that's the native conformation, okay, the native protein, the, pro the conformation which has the lowest free energy, and that's why it's the most stable, because now uh, you can't go any lower, basically. You can't give out any more energy, okay? Now, of course, if some molecules bang into you, then temporarily you can get some energy and you can move back up again a bit, but then you'll just lose that energy a, a few seconds later, and then you'll drop back down again. So that's why the native conformation is so stable, because if you do change slightly, you'll just drop back down to the native conformation anyway, because of the way that thermodynamics works with it being easy to give out energy, but it takes a lot of luck to get energy back again. Okay, right. So that's how um, we can solve the levin fowl paradox, which is basic. well, I'll outline how this solves the levin fowl paradox. The levin fowl paradox was basically that you had to go through every single one of these conformations on this surface uh, to find the native conformation. The way this solves the levin fowl paradox is it says, no, once you've moved uh, to a new conformation that's at a lower level in energy, you now have a restricted number of conformations that you can ever adopt, okay? The conformational space you can now go to is reduced. You can only really now go to the conformations that are at the same level as you or below, okay? So the idea is that when you make a conformational change that moves you down the energy level, now, there's only uh, a much smaller number of confirmations that you can ever now hope to explore, basically. And then you'll make another one, and then that will restrict your confirmational space that you can explore even more until you're finally down at that native protein where you can't go any further, and that's the only state that you can now explore. Okay, right. Now, how does that relate back to this picture of it actually folding? Well, basically, when it's forming this alpha helix, that's now very stable. And when it formed that alpha helix, it would have given out a lot of energy. So basically, whenever it forms these structures, it basically uh, corresponds to you moving down this uh, free energy funnel, basically, towards that native state right at the bottom. Okay, so that's free energy funnels and how they're helpful in understanding the resolution to Levin-Fowles paradox.